In the voice of Russia World Service, welcome to another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow. Last time, we started telling you about the Reverend Matrona Nikonova, a Moscow saint who was born in 1885 and died in 1952. Let me remind you that she was born in a poor peasant family in Tula region, approximately 300 kilometers to the south of Moscow. She was born totally blind, with firmly shut eyelids and a cross-shaped protrusion on her chest. As is the custom, she was christened 40 days after birth. When the local clergyman Vasily Troitsky dipped her into the font, a column of light, sweet-scented steam rose up from the font to the ceiling. The clergyman was amazed and said, I have christened many an infant, but have never seen anything like this before. This infant shall be a saint. Before reaching adulthood, Matrona received the Lord's gift of foresight, while at seven, she was also endowed with the gift of healing. This fact became widely known, and from that time on, the Nikonov's homestead began to draw the ailing and afflicted from all over the region, who made their way here daily in the hopes the little girl would work a miracle for them. People begged Matrona to pray for them, and cure them of their illnesses. In gratitude for the help received, visitors left the young healer's parents various gifts and food packages. Thus, the blind and poor Limatrona didn't become a burden for her parents, as they had feared, but was the family's main breadwinner. In 1925, Soon after the October Socialist Revolution in Russia, the Blessed Matrona, who had then turned 40, was forced to leave her native village because of her elder brothers, Mikhail and Ivan, both staunch communists and, as such, atheists. The two were irritated by the ceaseless procession of needy and ailing folk coming to their homestead because of Matrona. Besides, bearing in mind the persecutions that revolutionary authorities subjected Orthodox Christians to, the brothers feared for their own lives and the lives of their family and kin. For this reason, Matrona, with the help of friends, found herself in Moscow, where she had relatives and acquaintances. She was forced to move from one apartment to another, avoiding confrontation with the atheist authorities. The Lord kept watch over her. She always knew in advance when they were coming to arrest her, and so... She was able to move on and avoid arrest. Her friends always managed to take her to some safe place in the nick of time. Matrona's life followed pretty much the same as always. In the daytime, she received visitors, and at night, she prayed. In this manner, the years passed. <coughs> Living in Moscow, the blessed Matrona spent the longest stretch of time staying in the home of Zinaida Zdanova, whose mother came from the same village as Matrona. Her personal recollections of Matrona continue our narrative. 
I was getting ready for entrance exams to Moscow's Architecture Institute. Prior to that, I had already failed twice. I turned to the Blessed Matrona for help, requesting her to pray for me. She replied, Oh, you shall pass, you shall pass. But the competition was very strong, and besides, a great many of the applicants were offspring of the high and mighty, and as such were given preferential treatment. So I really had little hope. I tormented Matrona with my doubts, and still she persisted, saying, You'll be there, don't worry. I took the exam, and once again failed. I just missed by one point to make the grade. So I came to Matrona crying, and she touched my head with her fingers and said, You shall be there, I'm telling you. I must say, I felt totally confused. A month passed. Studies had already begun at the Institute. I was strolling somewhere in the center of Moscow when one of the administrators from the Institute recognized me and asked, Why aren't you at classes? I replied, I didn't pass the entrance exams. What do you mean you didn't pass? he asked. You'd better come along with me. And he led me to the Institute. When we arrived there, he told me to wait for him. In the meantime, he made his way to the director's office. When he came out from the director, he said to me, Go to classes immediately. You shall be enrolled by the end of the day. And that is how Matrona's prophecy came true. In 1941, the Lord revealed to me the mystery of my enrollment at the Institute. At the time, our architecture institute was evacuated to Tashkent, capital of the Central Asian Republic of Uzbekistan. In the vestibule, there lay a pile of personal files of students and staff workers of the institute. I found my file there too, and what did I see? By God's will, when applying for the institute, I had made a mistake in filling in my biography. I had written that my father was working for the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, the NKVD. Some clerk had underlined this in red pen. Well, in actual fact, my father was employed in an organization under the jurisdiction of the NKVD. This unwitting mistake of mine had been conducive to my enrollment at the Institute. <laughs> Matrona was totally illiterate, yet the Lord revealed everything to her. Here is one example. In 1946, I was to present my diploma project at the Institute. It was the draft of a building of the Department of the Navy. My curator, for some reason, had taken a keen dislike for me. In five months of work, he never once offered his advice, and obviously intended to flunk my diploma project. Two weeks before I was to uphold my paper before the teaching commission, he announced, Tomorrow a commission is coming over to pronounce that you failed your diploma project. I came home in tears. Father was in jail at the time, and Mother and I lived on my student's grant. I had but one hope left, to successfully graduate and begin working. After listening to my complaints, Madrona responded, Never mind, you'll do fine. This evening when we have our tea, we shall talk. I could barely wait till evening. Finally, Matushka Matrona said to me, Let us now go to Italy, to Florence, Rome, and see the works of the great masters. <laughs> At this point, she began to describe Italian streets and buildings. Then she suddenly stopped and said, Here is the Pitti Palazzo. Here is another palace with arches. Why don't you do it like this, with three lower floors of the building in large masonry, and let there be two entrance arches? I was amazed at what she was saying. Of course, I took her advice and made alterations to my project. 
In the morning, I rushed to the Institute with a renewed project. At ten, the commission promptly arrived. The architect scrutinized my work and said, Why, this is excellent. What a good project. Thus, thanks to Madrona's help, my diploma paper was a success. Zinaida Zdanova, whose recollections you have just heard, referred to the Blessed Matrona as the epitome of the angel warrior, with a sword of fire in hand, fighting evil. Matrona was born a saint, something that set her apart from other Orthodox zealots, who with their deeds over time were granted the gift of saintliness from the Lord. Obviously, this helped her manage the torrent of sorrow and grief, that countless visitors inundated her with daily. People who came to her for help were Muscovites and from other towns, representing diverse strata of society. Some were common folk, others intelligentsia, military folk. There were so many of them. At times, the Blessed Matrona received up to 40 people a day. Small of stature and as fragile as a child, she usually sat down on her bed cross-legged, while the visitors stood before her on their knees. Madrona stretched out her two little hands and touched the person's head with her fingertips. She would make the sign of the cross over them, pray for them, and then, very briefly, say a few words, the kind of words their soul most needed to hear. She never said anything superfluous. At times, she consoled a crying person by taking their head into her hands and simply holding them, thus praying all the while. And the person would leave, thus fortified spiritually, although they had just been close to utter despair. During the war, Matrona told Zinaida Zdanova that she made invisible visits to the front to help our soldiers. In those years, she was often people's only source of information regarding their relatives and friends. She replied to people's questions, saying, Alive, wait for him or her, or they've died. Arrange for the burial service. Zinaida Zdanova recalls the following incident. My mother had a friend who was notified of her husband's death three times. Matrona, however, kept insisting, He is alive. He shall come home on the day of the Kazan icon of the Mother of God and will knock on the window. The war ended, but my mother's friend still hadn't found her husband. It was only two years after Victory Day in 1947 that he returned home. And it was indeed on the day of the Kazan icon of the Mother of God, just as Matrona had predicted. Matrona cured people of various torments cast upon them by the demons. For example, once four men brought an old lady to her who was waving her arms like a windmill. After Matrona read some prayers over her, the woman grew calm and stopped waving her arms about. Another case. The mother of one acquaintance of mine suddenly fell ill with epilepsy. During these attacks, she fell to the floor, foaming at the mouth and squirming and arching convulsively. They brought her to Matrona. The latter sat tensely, leaning forward, stretching out her little hands, and then pronounced... Oh, what a big demon they've sent into her. Reading the necessary prayers over the head of the unfortunate possessed woman, Madrona addressed the woman with the words, I cannot cope with your demon alone. If you help me, then you shall live. You need to take the sacrament every Sunday. And that is what the woman did. A Catholic Polish woman came to see Madrona. Her name was Helia. She wept as she showed us the hump that had grown on her back. 
All of us who were present in the house touched that hump and couldn't believe our eyes. It was like a camel's. As it transpired, these were the dealings of a witch who lived opposite Helia's house. On that occasion, Matrona had to work really hard. She read prayers over Helia for a whole week, and the woman's hump disappeared. Matronoshka was forced to not only treat the victims of witchcraft, but to fight with those practicing sorcery. She frequently told me that she was waging a struggle against witches, and that struggle was taking up a lot of her strength. True, sometimes those practicing sorcery came to her for help. I once heard her conversation with an old man, very dignified and sedate. He fell to his knees before Matrona, and weeping, told her that his only son was dying. Matrona immediately recognized that this was a sorcerer before her, and by practicing the devil's will, he'd brought death unto his own son. He hoped Matrona would save his son. However, she said resolutely, "Be gone from me! You have no business with me." After he'd gone, she said to me. Sorcerers know God. If only you all prayed the way they do when they beg for the Lord's mercy and forgiveness for their evil sins. The blessed Matrona's nights were spent in prayer. She had almost no time left for sleep. Actually, she didn't really sleep at all, but only drowsed off with her arm tucked under her head. With remarkable courage and stoicism, never complaining, Matrona carried her heavy burden of elderhood to the end of her days. Dying. She bequeathed all those who knew her to come to her grave and share with her their joys and sorrows, as if she were alive, and asking her blessing regarding various serious events in their lives. She predicted that several years after her death, her grave would become a site of pilgrimage, and so it happened. The Blessed Matrona died on May the second, nineteen fifty-two. The burial service for Matrona was held at the old Moscow Church of the Priestly Ordination, not far from Donskoy Monastery. Gathered for the burial service were many monks from the famous Holy Trinity Saint Sergius Monastery, who had personally known and honored the Blessed Matrona. A witness of those events, the nun Antonina recalls. The burial service was amazing. The soul simply rejoiced. And then they carried the coffin holding Matrona's body to the cemetery. People followed on foot, right along the tram rails. They dug a grave two meters deep, placed the coffin in, and everyone threw a handful of sand, as is the custom. There were so many miracles and healings at Matrona's grave. That their account filled up a thick volume. We would like to offer you one of the oral testimonies from 
a Muscovite, Юлия Медведева. Однажды, когда я была в церкви, я купила книжку, когда пришла домой, то начала читать. Once I bought in church a book about the Blessed Matrona. I read it to the end, unable to put it down. I learned that she'd been buried in Moscow at the Danilov Cemetery and decided to visit her grave because I read that she had summoned everyone to come to her grave after her death whenever they were in need of help. However, I wasn't going there for help, but simply to become acquainted with her. I kept thinking of her as of a living person. I came to the cemetery and saw a lot of people at Matrona's grave. They were singing chants. When they finished, I suddenly heard in the silence a voice that sounded within me and was addressed to me. So, we have met. And then, you're involved in astrology? Never mind, you shall give it up soon. I was astounded. Indeed, at the time I was fascinated by astrology and regularly attended lectures in astrology. I was already aware that it was a sin, that practice in astrology was conducive to developing satanic pride in a person, that it spelled death for the soul, but I was simply too caught up in it. I felt helpless and too weak to fight this interest. However, after those words of Matrona's, I discovered that astrology suddenly lost all attraction for me, and I stopped attending lectures of astrologists. Moreover, this happened without any exertion of will on my part. This is how Matrona the Blessed saved me from spiritual death. <laughs> As we've already said, on March the 8th, 1998, the acquisition of the holy relics of the Blessed Matrona took place. A year later, she was canonized as a Moscow saint. At the request of a nun of the Moscow Pakrovsky convent of the holy intercession of the Mother of God, who looked after her grave, the relics were transferred to that convent. From then on, the convent has become a site of pilgrimage for people not only all across Russia, but from all over the world. The nuns carefully collect and write down all testimonies of miraculous help received by people from the Blessed Matrona. Already, a part of these have been published. The Mother Superior of the convent, Hegemonis Fiafania, attests. <laughs> She helped everyone. People come here from all over the world. Africans come here. They aren't Orthodox Christians. However, Matrona the Blessed helped them too. Thus, only yesterday people came from Switzerland. One can go on and on, narrating cases of Matrona's miraculous help. She aided officers and members of the government too. She helped our convent when we were rebuilding it from ruins. In the years of Soviet rule, it had been closed down and almost completely ruined. Over time, the territory and buildings that survived had been transferred to tenant companies. When in the 1990s the convent was returned to the church, it was a big problem evicting the tenants. In total disregard of all orders from the authorities, they refused to leave. The sisters and I prayed a great deal, took sand from the Blessed Matrona's grave and sprinkled it around the premises where they lodged. Eventually, they gave up and vacated our territory. Today, many of them are our friends and help the convent. <laughs>
If we were to attempt to briefly determine just what was the main fate of the Blessed Matrona's life, you come to the conclusion that it was impatience, a great patience stemming from a purity of heart and passionate love for people, a kind of patience that the Holy Fathers of the Orthodox Church had prophesied would save people. The Blessed Matrona, just like any true Christian zealot, taught people Christianity not so much in words as in the feet of her whole life. Physically blind, she taught and continues to teach us true spiritual vision. It is hard to find a church in Russia these days where they wouldn't have an icon of the Blessed Matrona. She is pictured in a white headscarf with her eyes closed and her right palm raised as if blessing all those who address her. You are listening to a narrative about the Blessed Matrona of Moscow, one of Russia's most venerated saints who was canonized in 1999. And there we end another program in the series The Christian Message from Moscow. All the very best to you. And may God save you from all evil, visible and invisible. <laughs>